A uh, pleasant good morning, one and all, and welcome to Caribbean Exports uh, webinar series, Exporting, where we're going to discuss music and COVID during and after the digital pivot. I'm Alison Francis, a services specialist at Caribbean Export, and I want to welcome our moderator, Tiana Mora, our presenters, Carlos and Karen. Just to know that, you know, the, the seminar, as we look at the, the, the importance of this issue, and we look at the two, the topics here are the two topics that will be presented by Carlos and by Karen. When I saw, you know, the issue of the urgent digital pivot, it reminded me of a basketball game. And it's like you're coming on the court and in front of you is COVID. So you had to do a pivot. And the pivot may require you to throw that, pass that ball to somebody else, or you dribble around the object. And in this case, you know, as we discussed with both Carlos in his, his very good um, topics here, and what we are going to, I think it will be a very interesting discussion. So without further ado, I will hand you over now to Tiana. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alison, and good morning to everybody. Thank you for joining us. We have uh, two uh, experts on, on the subject, two people that breathe and leave music. Uh, so first, we're going to hear from Carlos Delgado Inver. Uh, this webinar is brought to you by Caribbean Export and by the UKTP project, uh, which is financed by DFIT and uh, coordinated by the International Trade Center. And um, Carlos is a consultant for the UKTP program and has, um, in spite of his age, has many years in the music industry, an honorary graduate from Berkeley. A school of Music and uh, experience in different areas of uh, of the business, from publishing uh, to financing to to marketing and distributing, and of course, uh, musician uh, himself. So first, we'll hear from Carlos, and then we'll hear from Kieran Niles. Uh, Carlos, I'll give I'll pass the microphone to you. Thank you, Diana. Uh, well, hello, everyone, and thank you for this opportunity. Uh, standing by for the uh, for the sharing screen, also, uh, Diana, to share the presentation. So, yeah, as as everyone has mentioned, we are going to share a couple of uh, interesting uh, pieces of information, action plans, and and tools to give you ideas and things to do specifically in order to deal with the uh, with the new reality, I, I think, and, and a lot of people have said it, people who know more about health than me, it's not gonna be life after COVID, it's going to be life with COVID in the near future. So that's that's what we should be preparing for in terms of our concern, which is the, uh, the music industry. Okay, so. And I'm sending my oh, okay. I got it. All right. So, can you see the uh, presentation? USD 31 billion by 2022. Yes. All righty. Great. So, this is this was the reality that we were working with uh, in terms of live music. So, this is a study from 2018 by Price Waterhouse Coopers. Uh, live music industry was going to generate 31 billion by the year 2022. Uh, this was before March uh, 2020. So there's definitely going to be a reality check on this. Uh, this is not going to happen uh, next year. It will happen eventually, yes, but it's not what, what we're going to see. Uh, so in terms of the live music, uh, in terms of music, the live music sector is definitely going to be uh, the most affected. And this is, you know, reality check number one in this uh, situation. We've seen plenty of headlines uh, from US, Canada, the Caribbean, all over the world. Uh, live music activity is basically at zero, okay? And again, this is what we have to deal with in the short term. Uh, plenty of festivals, plenty of one-off shows have been uh, canceled. Uh, most of the organizations, if not 
all organizations have been extremely responsible. So, you know, uh, festivals are refunding money, venues are honoring tickets for future dates, uh, bands who sold uh, tickets directly to fans are refunding. So in that regard, you know, your first responsibilities towards your fans. So if, if you have any pending transactions, uh, think of the long term and, and how to keep those fans engaged uh, while things get settled in the short term. So one of the one of the first exercises that I wanted to do with you is, you know, take a look at yourself. Uh, in terms of your daily music activities, what percentage of revenue comes from live music? What percentage comes from streaming? And what percentage comes from publishing? I've, I don't have the capacity to see all your answers, but I can say in general terms, I'm sure that for most of the artists who are in attendance, more than 50% of their revenue at least comes from uh, from live music. So it's it's gonna be it's it's a tough blow that's for sure you know all that all that money is not going to be realized this year but the, the future is uh is here uh also uh very soon so there's plenty of opportunities of things that we can do today you know to continue activities continue building our careers and continue making money okay uh something that doesn't look too good also has been you know the most recent data is that music streaming is uh, has also decreased from the main platforms, and we and we've seen Netflix as the uh, as the winner on this. Uh, so you can say Netflix is quote unquote more entertaining since it, since it has its the uh, the audiovisual component. So you know it, music streaming has decreased a bit also on 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 the audio only platform. So. One of the things that that we can focus on is the opportunity here. So, yes, you know, Spotify, Deezer, all the music streaming platforms have, you know, represent an important chunk of of our revenue. But there are things beyond, uh, you know, uh, Spotify, Deezer, Apple Music. Uh, Question number two for the artists. How many of you are on Twitch? How many of you know this platform? Uh, you know, 10 years ago, Facebook was new media, quote unquote, but Facebook is now 15 years old. And that's not the only digital platform that's going to dominate over the next couple of years. So if we see the uh, the viewership on Twitch since March, it's increased fivefold, okay? Uh, so again, you know, things are not looking great now for some sectors, yet audiovisual streaming is increasing at very healthy rates. Uh, Facebook, YouTube, and Netflix are showing large increases. So further down the line, and this was on one of the articles that I shared with you, that one of the Caribbean experts shared with you over the weekend, Facebook is up, Netflix is up, YouTube is up in terms of websites and in terms of apps, YouTube has decreased a bit with Facebook and Netflix having a modest uh, increase. So not everything is lost, you know, in terms of music. And fans still want to hear music. Fans still want to see their their favorite bands live. But there are definitely some uh, some constraints in the short term. So beyond Facebook, uh, Spotify, Netflix, YouTube, there are things. Uh, I'm showing you three. Uh, logos of what I call the quote unquote new Facebook and new Instagram companies. Uh, if you can name those three, that's great. If not, you know, there's some homework to do. The, uh, the first one is Twitch. The second one is TikTok, which is definitely uh, gaining up a lot of steam over the past you know, year, six months, depending on the country. And the last one is what I call, again, quote unquote, the new TikTok which is uh, an app called Triller, uh, which uh, if you don't, don't know about it, I encourage you to uh, take a look at it and explore if it makes sense for you to join. Okay, so we are living in the year 2020 where Spotify and Apple Music are not the future <laughs> anymore. Uh, these companies 
are the future of, of music industry and what does the future mean? That means uh, potential higher uh, growth rates in terms of users, in terms of listenership. That doesn't mean that Spotify and Apple Music are not fundamental to, uh, to have in place, but things keep moving forward. And usually uh, in terms of, of the music industry, technology is what dictates what's, uh, what's going to happen. Okay, so it's always advisable to be in touch with with these developments. And as I mentioned, Facebook was new 15 years ago. Spotify was new 10 years ago. TikTok was new two years ago, one year ago. Uh, so things are going to keep evolving and you're going to see how different artists make the most out of each of these platforms. So in terms of what's happening right now, yes, live music, is gone uh, in, in one word, but the platforms are active, uh, new platforms are emerging, artists are using platforms in different ways. So there is always going to be opportunities. And one thing to keep in mind, especially in the music industry, there are less obstacles to connect with fans than there were five years ago, even less 10, 15, 20 years ago. So plenty of things that are in the hands of artists to, uh, first of all, to experiment, understand if it works, and then continue building. So, you know, grim, grim prediction for, uh, for next year and this year in terms of, of live music, but if we uh, look into the future, uh, this was a, a news piece that came out about two weeks ago, uh, global music industry, is going to double in value to 142 billion um, over the next 10 years. So that's opportunity. You know, uh, thinking of the long term, the we are in a healthy industry. It's tough, as any of the arts are. Yet, going back to what I mentioned a couple of minutes ago, every day the barriers to connect with your fans and potential fans are decreasing. So. This is an interesting time. Uh, we can think of what happens in the Caribbean when we get hit by a hurricane, you know, specifically with the trees. The trees might get blown off, but the roots are there and they grow back in a year, in two years. And the trees grow differently. They might not be as straight as they were before the hurricane. They, may, they might lean to one side, lean to the other side, but they are growing. They keep growing because the roots were there. So as artists, think of the things that you can do today to keep those roots alive. Yes, the tree may have been blown off by the uh, by the COVID hurricane, but you still have your roots. So I'm going to ask you a couple of questions, and these are exercises that we can do right now. So who are you as an artist? You know, it's great. You know, Tayana was mentioning, hey, Carlos graduated from Berkeley and this and that, but who are you is these days dictated by what you can find on Google about yourself. So artists, please, uh, you are in your computer or in your phone, take five seconds, Google your name, see what comes up. And I made a couple of exercises with global mainstream artists that we all know. So I Googled Adele, first results, Wikipedia, Instagram, website, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and Spotify. And I'll go line by line and we'll share with you something that I think is fundamental. So Wikipedia page, free. Instagram, free. Official website may cost you, you know, 50 US dollars to maintain a page on a yearly basis. Facebook, free. YouTube, free. Twitter, free. Spotify distribution, uh, there are companies that do distribution for free. Uh, and I'm gonna mention a couple in case you don't know. Uh, Amuse is a uh, European company with operations in the US. They have free distribution. So they'll put your music on Spotify and Apple Music at no cost. Another company, which I'm sure you know, uh, CD Baby, they do single distribution for $9.99 uh, per, Per track. So where am I going with this? Adele, global artists, all the millions in the world behind them from their label, all the revenue 
in the world in terms of streaming live music. And there's nothing too complicated about these results. Uh, Wikipedia, free. Instagram, free. Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, free. And then modest sums to maintain a website and, and distribution, okay? So who are you? Who is Adele? Well, this is Adele. This is what I can find when I look for her online. First page, Drake, uh, same, almost the same results. Wikipedia, Instagram, YouTube, Facebook. This case, all these, the first four results are resources that we all have in our hands. Carlos Delgado can go on YouTube and create his website in less than 10 minutes and start streaming, okay? Who is Taylor Swift? This is Taylor Swift. No, her website, Instagram, Wikipedia, YouTube, and Facebook. Okay, so first exercise that I want you to do uh, in terms of uh, self-assessment, Google your name. See what comes up. If if these pages don't come up, on if, if these results don't come up on the first page of results, then that's the opportunity. You know, you have, uh, again, these things are in your hands. Instagram, YouTube, Facebook, official website. These are things that you can do today to get your name out there as an artist, okay? So what are you doing today? You know, the coronavirus has, again, stopped music, uh, stopped live music almost to zero, to be practical. Uh, but if we go on the news, we see plenty of people who are not only being active, but are also generating news because of their activities. And that's that's a, a great place to be, where you don't have to chase a press release, you don't have to chase an interview, but things that you do get covered on the press because they are notable. So even though um, live music has practically stopped, so got Denmark, uh, drive-in concerts. This happened uh, beginning of May. You know, May 1st, of course, this is a, uh, a much more reduced uh, situation, but uh, there, there's people on, on stage you know, performing. The car acts as the perfect you know, self-isolation booth. Uh, and of course, yeah, if, if you were going to sell a thousand tickets, now you're probably going to sell 200. But this is good. You know, people are, are keeping their activities and understanding things that they can control and being creative, you know, putting together uh, concepts that are out there and performing for fans. One thing to be clear, we can have COVID-19, 20, 30, 50, 100. People are not going to stop wanting to listen to music. People are not going to stop wanting to go and see their favorite acts. Okay, so Denmark, uh, kind of figure it out you know, in, in, in terms of, of how to run shows. Um, there's a video of a rave in Germany that I can share later if we have some time, but basically the same idea. You know, someone on stage performing, everyone in their cars, honking their horns, using their, their glow sticks. So live music is somewhat alive. Of course, not at the, at the level that it was before COVID, but live music exists with COVID. Uh, this is in the U.S. Drive-in concert tour. Mark Rebele, uh, eighty dollars a ticket with uh, admission for two people per car. So they figure it out. You know, they're they're charging for cars uh, in terms of individual admissions, and the beat goes on. You know, Mark figure it out, and he's doing a tour. Let's see how it goes. Okay. So in terms of live music, there are things that are happening today. You know, people are figuring it out. And you know it's it's an experiment. We'll see what what comes out of it. Uh, if the concern is people isolating, then go in your car, don't mingle with other people, and the music is still going to be there. Okay, so think about the things you can do in terms of your live performances. Okay, uh, there is a uh, platform called Bandcamp. If you didn't know about it, then this is a direct mention to them. Uh, I don't know anyone at the company, but I'm sure they're doing uh, a lot of research and seeing what ways they can keep uh, bands in their sight and keep them in, in touch 
with their fans. So something that Bandcamp did, uh, and this is from their website, they've waived their revenue share in order to help artists and labels impacted by the pandemic. So on the days that Bandcamp waived their fees, so uh, taking, a, taking a step back, uh, Bandcamp allows bands to sell stuff directly to uh, to fans. So whether it's merchandise, music, you name it, uh, you can sell it through Bandcamp. They take a percentage of what's sold and that's the way they make money. So they've waived their fees a couple of times already and the revenues have increased. So it means that there's more money that artists have been able to make with the already created platform that they had on Bandcamp. So they've done this waiving uh, two times. There's two more wave dates on June 5th and July the 3rd. Uh, and as I say, they're the first Friday of each month. So opportunity, you know, the, if you have things to present to your fans, uh, Bandcamp in general is a great place. And now even better that they are waiving the, uh, their closing fee. And something to, uh, to keep in touch, uh, to keep in mind, the fans will be there for you too. So if you look at the second line, uh, on their first waiver date, March 20th, uh, fans spent 4.3 million US dollars on music and merch, 15 times the amount of a normal Friday. So people showed up and people responded. So that's that's hope. And that's something that's happening right now. Okay, so that's something else uh, that I see as an important opportunity uh, that for any artist, uh, regardless of where they're based. Uh, Live streaming, you know, this is probably something that uh, not not may not be as as news generating as a live as a drive-in concert, for example. But people have taken it to the next level, and since artists and fans are emphasizing live streaming more these days, uh, we're seeing newsworthy situations here. Uh, I think taking it locally, uh, Jamaican artists. Are doing live streams and and these uh, and these live streams were covered by CNN. This is a a headline from uh, from CNN, so that was newsworthy and and you know the engagement is is there. You know, as I mentioned, you know, fans want to hear music, fans want to see music, and and artists have the responsibility to get their music to those fans and the people will show up, the people will be there and the people will support you. Um, other things that are happening, um, fundraisers, you know, the Lady Gaga One World, 127 million raised, uh, coronavirus uh, fundraiser in New Jersey, uh, coronavirus fundraiser in India. Um, again, uh, taking it local, Jamaica, uh, two, two newsworthy uh, situations, uh, Jamaica Telethon, for uh, healthcare workers with some musicians involved. Um, Wyclef uh, put together uh, an event, a benefit concert on May uh, 17. So, you know, artists at, at the highest levels, which, you know, Wyclef is a global figure, artists at the global level are responding. Uh, Wyclef, Lady Gaga, question for you, what is happening in your countries in terms of what artists are doing? What can you do to take the helm of a potential effort to raise funds, not necessarily for you, but for others. Uh, this is thinking about, you know, something that could be bigger than the actual situation and it generates news. So that's, these are things that are happening uh, across the world with mainstream artists involving independent artists and, and local artists to make things happen. Okay, so live streaming, live music, plenty of things that we can do. So let's make an emphasis on this. Uh, and this is something that I went over uh, on the beginning. It's not, don't think about the future of live shows. Think about live shows with COVID uh, because that's what's happening right now. And that's gonna be the, uh, the framework for the next couple of months, probably the next couple of years. So. A big finger pointing at you, the artists, the fans definitely want you. Uh, COVID doesn't mean that fans don't want to listen to music. Uh, COVID means that the way they're going to consume live music is going to be different. 
we've seen how in Denmark, Germany are doing the uh, the drive-in concerts. In the U.S., there's a tour for an artist. Uh, there's also some initiatives in New Zealand, which I'll share a bit later too. So check this out. This is from Live Nation, the largest music promoter in the world. 91% of global live music goers say they want to return to concerts. Extremely good sign. 90% of fans are holding on to their tickets for rescheduled shows. They don't want the refunds. I'll keep my ticket. I'll stand by for when the show is going to happen. 79% of fans plan to be back at events within four months of restrictions lifting. No one knows when the restrictions are going to be lifted, but 79% is an extremely good number uh, for, uh, for intention to attend shows. 72% uh, of live stream viewers say watching virtual shows makes it more excited about attending live shows in person. So all good signs. Yes, uh, future with coronavirus, uh, cleaning of venue and hand sanitizers are going to be uh, key. So you know, thinking of a joke, go into the hand sanitizing in, of industry and leave music for a while because that's definitely going to be uh, what fans are looking forward to the most in terms of protocols and how venues are going to handle the, uh, the current reality that we live in. Uh, so this is the operating protocol of Temple Live. This is a venue which uh, hosted a show a couple of weeks ago. And look at the first line, you know, capacity is reduced 80%. So yeah, there's going to be less money in terms of what can be generated, but the beat goes on. And if you keep reading, you know, plenty of health protocols, the uh, sanitizing, the social distancing. So this is what we have to deal with in terms of uh, live music for the foreseeable future. Live music is not dead, is still alive with plenty of new uh, new things to keep an eye on. Uh, this is a New Zealand uh, situation. Um, Together Again concert and comedy series. This is happening now. So this is gonna Friday, 29th of May. This is gonna be at the end of this week. So the beat goes on, okay? So, you know, thinking about what's happening, live streaming shows, online presence, more questions for you. And these are actionable items that are within your reach. Online presence, okay? Let's think of uh, the three main platforms that, that pop into mind as of today for me. So YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram. One of the first exercises that you should do, check out your websites, and figure out if your URL is your name or if it's something else. Uh, if it's not customized, definitely get it customized. Um, steps are pretty easy to follow. Uh, I can share the links uh, on the chat, but if you Google, you know, customize my URL on Facebook, customize my URL on Instagram, customize my URL on YouTube, you will have the steps there. And that is something that will give you more uh, more of an organized presence presence on your uh, on your different sites and speaks well about what's on your mind in terms of how you present yourself to the to the public. Um, digital real estate. This is uh, the second thing that I want you to uh, to look at. So, for example, let's go to Adele's hello. Uh, YouTube video page. What does she have on the more information uh, section? She could have put anything in there. Uh, she could have said, this is my latest track, or uh, hey, I'm Adele, I'm from the UK, or thank you everyone for reaching out to me, which are great messages. But she chose to put these things, uh, links to where people can continue engaging with her. So her website, her iTunes, Amazon, Google Play, and Target direct links to buy her 25 album. That's the first section. On the second section of the more information, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram pages. So fans can continue clicking. Um, the fourth uh, section is her Vivo link. And after that, 
you know, credits for individuals who uh, participated. So what's the opportunity here? Use your more information section on YouTube to keep fans clicking, okay? Uh, it's great to say, yeah, I'm Carlos, I'm from the Dominican Republic, I enjoy music, that's great. Put things there that people can click on and can keep them engaged with your activities. We have different music stores, we have her social media, we have her Vivo, and yes, she's mentioning people, which is great, but your digital real estate is something that can either keep the fans engaged in you when they get to your YouTube uh, page in this specific case, or can be something that fans say, oh, that's great, that's it, you know, next video. So use that wisely and think of what you have going on that you can put in there to keep people clicking, okay? Uh, taking it to the local level, uh, Michelle Montano's Instagram, very wisely used. Uh, so he has the Monk Music Group page also linked there and also has further links. So when you click on, the, on that link in profile.com, you'll see more things about Michelle, you know, different websites, different pages, different distribution sites. So that's a great use of your digital real estate. And this is all within your hands. You don't need to pay anyone to put this on your Instagram. You don't need to pay anyone to put this on your YouTube. This is in your hands and keeps people uh, engaged. Uh, another local example, Spice, Queen of Dancehall. Booking information, email, phone number, another email, another link for people to, uh, to keep engaged. So two different uses of digital real estate in terms of Instagram, both valid because they keep people clicking and they keep providing information for people to connect with you. And this can be done during Corona, after Corona, before Corona. This is all within your hands and keeps people clicking, okay? Another local example at the global level, uh, Rihanna. First of all, check out her custom Facebook uh, URL. This is not facebook.com slash 1234RihannaYXJWZ. This is Rihanna. That's her artist name. That's her name on Facebook. Uh, on her contact info, she has her website, her Instagram, and her Twitter. Boom. Great pieces of information to keep people clicking. Okay? So in terms of your digital real estate, think about what you have going on. Think about the platforms that you are active in and think of ways where you can link everything you have going on on your different uh, sites, whether it's Instagram, YouTube, Facebook. There are plenty of tools that you have in your hands. Keep that information all together. So in terms of marketing, uh, one of the things that I encounter a lot when speaking with musicians is a limited view of what marketing is. You know, marketing is not something that you do once a year when you release an album. Marketing is something that you have to plan for uh, in advance, ideally, you know, three months in advance, six months in, in advance, a year in advance, if, if you feel inclined to, uh, to keep the, the wheels in motion. You know, marketing is what's going to take you beyond the friends and family audience. Uh, when, when artists send me tracks and they tell me, hey, Carlos, what do you think about this track? It's like, it's great, but you shouldn't care what I think about it. Uh, my opinion is worthless <laughs> about what your track is. You need to put that music out there, you need to market it and get it to the general public. And that's the opinion that you want. That's, that's what's going to speak to you. And that's what's going to put money on your, uh, on your bank account at the end of the day. So there is this great resource, uh, Amber Horsberg, Definitely uh, check it out. Uh, you can Google her right now or go to that specific website. Uh, she has something that's called a content sound check. Uh, we can go over it a bit later also during the Q&A section. But you can see how she basically uh, laid everything out in terms of your online presence, what you have going on, how to understand which platform is your biggest one and how to understand which activities generate the most uh, interaction 
with fans, whether it's Facebook likes or YouTube videos or Instagram posts. Uh, she's a pretty good marketer uh, and, and generates amazing information about what marketing should be in today's music industry for any type of artist, whether it's independent, global, mainstream, regional. Uh, so in terms of marketing, two things. Think about it as a constant exercise for you as a brand. And check out Amber Horsberg. Uh, she puts out a lot of good content, and I highly recommend it. Uh, if you wanted to start, uh, go to the content sound check and, and play with it, and we can go over it during the Q&A section also, okay? Third thing that, that you can do today are your affiliations up to date. Uh, do you know which organizations you should affiliate with? Uh, definitely plenty of options. Uh, in general, you should be looking at three main categories. Uh, your performing rights organization, uh, depending on your country, you will have whether it's COD, COSCAP, ECHO, um, if you're a composer, if you write songs, definitely affiliate with a performing rights organization. Definitely give them full information about all your music. So when the uh, when these uh, compositions generate airplay, you will have you can have access to your uh, to your royalties. Okay. Second affiliation that I that I put high up there in terms of importance, uh, distribution. Um, as I mentioned, you know, CD Baby, $9.99 to distribute singles. Uh, TuneCore has different models. Uh, Amuse is free. These are companies that will get your songs on all music platforms. Um, Apple, Deezer, Amazon, Spotify. And that's the general market that you're looking to, uh, to connect with. Okay, so definitely get a distribution company uh, and keep your account up to date. Uh, third sector of affiliations, if we, want to, if we want to refer to it this way, uh, performing rights for your sound recordings. Uh, in the US, there is Sound Exchange. In Jamaica, for example, there's Jams. Uh, these are organizations that collect not on your compositions, but on your sound recordings, your producer credits, and your performances. So when you recorded a track, if you if you got your uh, your credits on it, then you will generate revenue through these organizations. Uh, Audium at the bottom right is a company that collects royalties on YouTube activity. So definitely take a look at that one too, and and keep up to date with your affiliations. Uh, my team make a lot of work, but the way I see it, the first push is the toughest one. You know to get all the accounts in place. After that, just a matter of any time you produce something, every time you create something, run it through the uh, through the different affiliations you have. Register it, uh, distribute it, and get ready to collect royalties. You know if there's enough activity. So, thinking about this year, um, seven months to six months to go. Still, uh, every day is important. And one question for you. What is your plan for 2020? Do you have your releases uh, planned? Do you know what you're going to release next month, in the next three months? You know how many tracks you're going to release um, for the rest of the year? If not, then now is the time to do it. The more things you plan for, the more control you have over them. And the way I see it, um, you can plan for about 70 or 80% of the things that happen there's going to be always, you know, 20, 30 percent of things that either go wrong <laughs> or that don't happen or that you change your mind. You say, well, I'm not going to do it. Uh, and that's valid. But don't take that as excuses to not sit down, spend a couple of hours, a couple of days yourself or with your team and figure out what do you want to do uh, in terms of uh, of your work as a musician. I, I have a release uh, scheduler on Excel, which I'm gonna share with you uh, a bit later. Five, six columns, basically. Name of the track, when are you going to release it? Where are you going to distribute it? And what are you gonna do with it in terms of marketing, in terms of promotion, in terms of 
ancillary releases? Is it going to be just a track or a track with a video or a lyric video? Are you going to do a how did I make it video uh, along with it? So what is your plan for 2020? Uh, you can answer that with up to 70% accuracy, <laughs> opening up to uh, you know 30% of things that, that we don't know are going to happen and, and changes of plans. Okay, so um, what is your plan for 2020? Okay, and you know, at the end of the day, you we have to always make the most of what we can control. In this case, we I I wish we could control the COVID. Uh, we can't, but as we've seen, the music industry is not dead. Uh, plenty of opportunities out there. Plenty of platforms that anyone with internet access can use. Uh, so three basic questions. Who are you? Remember the Google exercise, what comes up? What are you doing in terms of live music, online activities? Remember the Bandcamp example, uh, group or individual activities? And what is your plan for 2020? Okay, so these are things that I definitely wanted to uh, to share with you. Uh, I understand we're gonna do Q&A at the end of all presentations and Thank you very much for your time. That's it. Thank you, Carlos. Um, we uh, we uh, have one question, well, a couple of questions about the rights and people are requesting that you turn your webcam so that I can see you. Um, the, the, um, how do you, the, about the rights on live stream? Uh, there is one question. Uh, somebody has put uh, its own music on YouTube uh, and streaming on YouTube and had some uh, infringement questions and also about their own rights. Uh, I mean, their own songs. And the other is a company from Belize that has a, a live streaming platform that they just launched and see right. how they go about um, the IP rights on uh, uh, that type of platforms. It's a platform right. for and DJs. All right, good. Uh, two questions, all very important. In terms of the first one, the artist uh, putting music on YouTube, I'm happy to do this one-on-one -on -one via email. We can do a, a phone call to get into specifics, but in general terms, you know, there's always, a question that you need that you need to ask when when uploading music to YouTube um, is the recording mine, and it, that's easy, yes or no. And it's the composition mine again, easy, yes or no. Um, YouTube and Google, and I'll say all websites, all the internet has the ability to understand what's being uploaded at any time, whether they make it general knowledge. That's that's their own thing, but you can be sure that anything you do online is being registered somewhere. In terms of YouTube, they have their content ID, and for example, uh, the the classic music industry example is uh, Bob Dylan, for example. Um, until recently, I don't know if he changed it. Uh, Bob Dylan didn't allow any uploads of his audio to YouTube. So if you try to upload any of his tracks, whether it's a background as a background to your presentation, or if you were speaking and there was a Bob Dylan song in the background, the recording, YouTube automatically blocked it because the owner of that recording said, YouTube, I don't want anyone uploading my audio on YouTube. And that's valid. You know, it's his. Uh, okay. Um, so that's something that anyone deals with. Uh, in terms of composition, same exercise. You know, if I'm a composer, if I'm a publisher, I can tell YouTube, hey, YouTube, uh, when you identify someone uploading my work, you can either block it, allow it to upload and keep track of it, or monetize it, put ads on it, and send me the money. Okay? So in your case, if you're not being allowed to upload the track, it appears to me that's either of those cases, whether it's a composition that the artists don't want a third party to upload or a sound recording 
that again the owner doesn't want to upload and, and again i'm happy to go over it specifically uh but those are the, the 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 two aspects of it you know what are you uploading and what has the the owner of those rights uh told you to to do okay uh so in terms of the uh of the online platform to feature other person other people's music uh again you know two key aspects uh in terms of technology, you know, the, the tech world, uh, that's what's been setting the agenda for any creative industry over the past 20 years. You know, it all started with the uh, DMCA, Digital Millennium Copyright Act, that was passed in the year 2000, and it basically gave the, uh, the online platforms free reign. Like, well, yes, you know what's being uploaded, but, you're not responsible. You can you can be a free harbor for anything that's uploaded. Uh, that has evolved uh, in terms of of you know rights and and what what artists can claim on the different sites. And and it one of the evolutions is the YouTube content ID situation, where YouTube of course knows what's being uploaded, and now it communicates with artists uh, saying, well, what do you want me to do? Okay, so. The key thing here is to understand what artists are uploading. Is it original content? Is, are these other tracks from other artists that they may not be in contact with? So, you know, it, 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 with a good disclaimer, you could basically do anything that you wanted. And this is going into legal advice, which I'm, I wouldn't be the best person to provide it to you. But, you know, think about what SoundCloud is doing, for example, uh, which is the largest. Uh, audio only distribution platform uh, in terms of, of monthly users. They have all types of music in there. Uh, take a look at their terms of services, terms of service, and you need to understand, you know, if, if you're not the owner of a, uh, of a musical work, whether it's a sound recording or a musical composition, then someone has a legitimate claim over it and over what happens to it. So it will be key to understand what type of music the uh, the DJs are going to upload and how that fits into the whole, you know, Digital Millennium Copyright Act, the YouTube content ID uh, parallels that you can do uh, on your own and figure out, you know, if you're generating revenue or if you're going to share revenue, how to connect any revenue that you generate with the rights holders that of, of those tracks that are being uploaded. Okay, so in terms of, of platforms and how to manage it, I will say, you know, if the YouTube had a, the YouTube question that we got asked a minute ago, had a, a one difficulty level being the easiest, yours is probably a seven or an eight in terms of infrastructure and content and the amount of people uploading. So it's a matter of understanding what's being uploaded and understanding how to communicate with the with the rights holders for both the composition and the recordings. Okay. All right. Um, so thank you, Carlos. Uh, please stay there for questions. Uh, more questions at the end. But now we have um, Kieran. Kieran Niles. Dr. Kieran Niles um, is also an expert on on the on the on the music in the Caribbean and also a musician himself. So uh, you can be, bring also your perspective and your experience uh, from the regional uh, side. Uh, Kieran, can you turn your webcam and the stage is for you at the moment. We can hear you. Uh, Turn on the mic. You need to turn on the mic, Kieran. We can hear you, Kieran. Oh. 
Oh, thank you. All right. Uh, I think, now, can you guys hear me now? Yes. No. Yeah, I can. I, I can. I can. I can actually unmute myself. So I was about to make a slide saying I can't unmute myself. <laughs> so thanks everybody. Uh, thanks so much, Diana. I appreciate the uh, time. So a couple of things. I'm going to dive right in. Um, I'm going to be speaking about this urgent data pivot, as I call it, um, from a, a really from a, from a practical perspective in terms of uh, and from an academic perspective. So I'm going to kind of try to bring two realms together in one here. And uh, let me just introduce myself really quickly. I, I run a small firm called Core Limited. I do research um, at the University of West Indies actually on cultural industries and trade. I'm a certified youth worker. Um, but this company actually manages a band, and I'm actually wearing their, their gear. I'm going to talk about that just now. Um, but before I do, of course, um, let me um, really and truly just kind of show the angle that I'm coming from in terms of being based in the Caribbean and trying to do a lot of what we've heard already for the day, actually, and, and actually accomplishing some of it. So, and what it actually takes to do that. So if you want to reach out to me afterwards, I'm just going to say this out front. Feel free, don't be shy. Uh, you can hit me up on Instagram or send me an email. All right, I'll try to put this slide back up at the end of the presentation. So first of all, I, in order to kind of really appreciate where we are today, I have to kind of talk about some of the unique characteristics of what actually happens in the Caribbean. And this is specifically as it relates to music, right? Um, so if I were to explain it, um, and for those of you who've actually met me before and have asked me a similar question, you'd have heard me say, well, in the Caribbean, you, well, in the, in the global industry, you have an upstream, a midstream, and a downstream for the, for the music sector. So, and the upstream is, we can call that like the raw talent, right? And then midstream is like the production, which is where we take the raw talent and we make it market ready. The, I think the, the most clear way that I've heard this explained, um, well, actually, the most clear metaphor that I've used that people said they understand is a better way to say that is um, if you think of the raw material that somebody scoops out of the ground, whether it's a diamond or oil and gas, you can't take the raw thing that they take out of the ground and put it in your car, right? For oil and gas. You can't take the raw thing that they, they drill out of the ground and put it in your car. It has to go to a refinery first. In the music industry, uh, it has to go to a studio first, but in addition to the studio, is another component in terms of intellectual property and in terms of artist man artist management. So what you produce and what the market requires should be harmonious, but it isn't always. The job of actually marketing the music that Carlos alluded to, the job of kind of ensuring that you um, you create content with the end user in mind, that's all the job of persons who are into music marketing and music management. And that happens in the midstream. The thing about um, the midstream in the Caribbean, um, I would say, is that that segment of our value chain is really small, right? We have loads of talent. We have no shortage of talent in this region. You throw a stone, you're going to hit somebody who can dance, sing, do something. Um, so the talent, the upstream production is not a problem. Our ability to put out work is not a problem. Um, the midstream in terms of getting it ready for market and also that which is why I made it orange. That's that um and I even go as far as saying um we have more booking art, more booking agents than we do managers and people who would actually think deeply about um music marketing, right? And so the other thing that I would say as well is we're now getting more robust in terms of our approach to downstream, which is when your product meets the market. So for oil and gas, to go back to my previous illustration, your downstream is, is the gas station. When you actually go to fill up your tank and you actually pay money for the product, that's your downstream. So when that's now becoming more developed, and I'm going to talk about, about that a little bit um, later. So let me move on. The three things that we're selling in this, in, in, in this industry to, to kind of simplify it, right? And sometimes for, particularly for investors, I have to kind of, um, demystify the industry. We sell three things for the most part. We sell recorded content, which is uh, the actual record that, that, that you listen to on Spotify, Amazon, Apple Music. That's, the, that's one of the things that we sell. And the, the reason why it's important to separate some of these things is because the revenue streams are different for each of them. So for, um, for the recorded content, if it ends up on radio, it's royalties. And again, if it's Amazon Music, 
uh, if it's many of these platforms, you can earn royalties from it. That um, for your live content, you usually get gate fees, but you can also now earn royalties from your live, and you should be earning royalties from your live content as well. And then the final thing that we sell is our brand, right? and we really have to. And the T-shirt that you just saw me wearing, of course, is uh, one way in which brands leverage their brand in order to make money. But we also do it through things like endorsements, right? Um, so I think the first thing that we have to like make sure that we're clear on is what are we actually selling and what are people paying for? Because every product that we put out there is unique. And so you have to kind of make sure that you understand the nature of your product and the revenue streams available for each product. That's really, really important. Make sure you under, I say that again, make sure you understand the nature of each product and the revenue streams available for that product. But in order to do that, you have to, you have to be very, very clear about what you're selling. You know, we spoke about, I mean, Carlos spoke about, you know, live streaming. Uh, the image that you're seeing on the screen is our live stream, right? So the, the band that my company manages um, is called Freetown Collective. And every, every Thursday at 6 p.m., we have a live stream, a, a concert on Facebook every Thursday, right? And so what are we trying to do is trying to ensure that we continue to engage with our audience. But you can also find ways of monetizing that, which is what I'm going to come to uh, a bit later. But I think uh, I'm not thankfully enough to spend as much time on this part um, because Carlos kind of really dove into much of this. But I, I really feel that for many artists, it's about building and leveraging your digital identity because some, some persons have a very limited one, some persons don't have one at all in terms of a, a robust digital identity. And, and some of the key questions that you need to ask yourself before jumping online and before um, you know, even constructing your, your Wikipedia page, you know, pushing out your Instagram, pushing out your, your Facebook is what, how do you really want to communicate your identity to the world? You know, what do you want people to think about when they see your brand? How do you want people to feel? You know, when, when they see your logo, when, when they hear your music, how do you want people to feel? I feel like that is a very important question that we tend to kind of look over um, and in terms of just trying to get something out there. And while that is, while getting something out there is important, um, you want it to be consistent. Because, and that's one of the things that you, you, you see when you do look at artists who are, are online, what you see is a digital presence that is consistent, right? So when you project your brand online, uh, it is really important that it should be done your mess one, your message should be consistent, and you should try to answer these questions first, as I, as I said in the last slide. Right? You, you make sure that your message, like you, you understand your own identity that you're trying to project to the world, and that you project it consistently across a number of different platforms. Right? I'm not here to tell you which platform to place, to place emphasis on, which one to choose. What I would say is this: you need to be clear about your strategy. You need to be clear about what are the kind of targets that you're trying to. Uh, reach and you also need to be clear about your goals right and I, I think that those kind of overarching themes are really important to kind of complement um what Carlos said before about going online and checking out TikTok checking out Twitter I, I think it's really really important that you're clear on what your strategy is because while you have infinite potential and infinite imagination and infinite talent you have a limited amount of time you have a limited amount of resources. So how you spread your, your resources across different platforms is entirely up to you. And so you need to be wise and you need to do it according to a strategy. I cannot stress that enough. And please, 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 I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say this until, until it becomes like a mantra. Please be consistent. Please have a brand strategy, right? And it is really, really important that it should, I mean, for me, I think it's really, really important that whenever somebody encounters you, they get the same kind of vibe. They, they understand what you're trying to achieve of the platform, whichever platform that you, they find you on, right? But I can't stress this enough, right? While social media is really trending and it's important, having your own website is very, very valuable. It is your own space. I don't have enough time to kind of dig into why having your own website is so critical, but it is, it is very critical to, I think, 
and I will always, I, I think I, I can argue this point at nauseum, but it is really important to have your own space, your own website, right? Um, you are competing with many other people on um, Instagram, on Facebook, and on social media, um, which for all intents and purposes is fine, but that can't be the only place that people find you. You can't always want to be there competing with everybody else, right? There should be a home space for you. And I think that's, that's really, really important. And every time you make a post, every time you do a press release, it should communicate your brand identity to the world. And I think that's, that's really, really important. Um, I just wanted to say this because I feel like, um, I feel like in the Caribbean particularly, it's important because the Caribbean is a very small space. <laughs> Uh, and I feel like it's something that we tend to just, you know, like glaze over. Whether or not you're having a live stream, whether or not you are, um, you're airing a pre-recorded concert, whatever your strategy is, you're probably going to want to tell the world about it. And telling the world about it, depending on the, your strategy, again, and depending on the demographic that you're, you're going to target, sometimes you're going to need to go to traditional media, right? And when doing so, I mean, in my opinion, a traditional media network is still vital and still quite useful. Um, and so um, while they may not always do what you want them to do and print what, what you want them to print, please um, be, be kind to the press. And I, I think um, that is something that we tend to overlook. And I, I don't think that we should, right? Um, I'm going to keep moving because there's, there's, there's some really important points I'm going to come to. On this point here, though, um, in terms of engaging the private sector, in terms of, because a lot of people are asking, so um, they can't perform, we're not having any of these uh, massive concerts anymore, how can I still make money? Um, and remember, at the, what, earlier in the, in the presentation I mentioned, there were three main ways in which we earn money. One was your live content, one was your recorded content, and the last one was your brand. And your brand really relates to not just merchandise, but also relates to those endorsements and working with the private sector. I, I know that there are a number of, of groups now who've really turned to working with the private sector in order to generate revenue. If that is what you're doing, please understand that they don't owe you anything, but it's really an exchange of value. And you also need to understand, again, you need to understand your carve-outs before entering into a negotiating room. And by carve-outs, I mean, what are those things that you will not entertain? Like, what are the, the brands that you do not want to associate with or the products that you don't want to associate with? For example, um, my two lead singers in Freedom Collective, one is a Muslim, one, and one is a Muslim, and one is a Rastafarian. Um, therefore, our brand usually does not align or doesn't actually ever align with alcohol beverages. Right? And so I know that before I enter into negotiation with someone. And more than once, that's actually proved to be very, 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 very important. So I think it's also a good time to engage your local private sector. Um, and, but you need to kind of understand what you're bringing to the table. First, and understand this exchange of value. And please know your carbots before entering the room. Um, I need to pause and say Eid Mubarak to all the uh, Muslim persons on the call. Um, and it's a public holiday in Trinidad because Eid was yesterday. And so we got the holiday today. So just in case there is anyone here on the call, uh, Eid Mubarak to you. So, um, the other thing I would say is this, right? Uh, we kind of got into digital distribution before, right? And uh, Carlos did a really good job. So I'm not, not going to repeat much of what he said in terms of so the options that are available to you. What I would say is this. One, you should be accessing some form of digital music distribution. But what I would say, though, is that there are different options if you're based in the Caribbean, right? And there, there are reasons why I will put it across like this. There are unique attributes to doing business in the music, doing music business in the Caribbean, right? And so there's some regional solutions, right? Um, and there's some international solutions. Of course, he talked about CDBB, there's also District Care, there's Empire, there's Tune Court, there's Group Nation. Um, but regionally, Fox News is also doing distribution. Tova Group is also doing distribution, right? And Shiga Media as well is doing distribution. Um, for the sake of transparency, Shiga also does our distribution. Um, Chromatics Music also does distribution. And one of the reasons why regional players got into the market is because of some of the structural problems that we face in the Caribbean, which I'm going to talk about, right? Because I, I feel like it's, it's really necessary to get a bit practical in terms of, if you're going to go off and do some of the things that we're going to suggest, you should know about some of the 
practical um, barriers that you will face, most likely, right? So a couple of things, right, in, in that regard. I think it's also really, really important right now to seek out publishing opportunities. Um, most people tend to, tend to treat music publishing as an afterthought. And I, I find that in the Caribbean, either people don't understand what it means, or they don't really, they think it's really scary. Um, it's heavily legal, um, but I think you can start with three things. One is that you can contact music publishers directly. Um, they are not heaps in the Caribbean, and I would say that much, um, but some music distribution um, companies like TuneCore do offer publishing services as well. Um, you can also contact music supervisors directly. Um, some people literally sit down, watch movies, look in the credits, <laughs> Or, what, or, or actually start to Google music supervisors. They get their email addresses. If you, you can actually, I mean, you can, there's a long way of doing it and there's a short way of doing it. You can find a way of contacting music um, supervisors and emailing them with your, um, with your music in hand to say, listen, I have this music. And by the way, for music supervisors, for those of you that are not familiar with the term, a music supervisor is someone who, um, they, they help to well, they facilitate synchronization deal. Uh, synchronization is when your music is synchronized to a film or a trailer or a documentary. The music supervisor decides what music goes into movies. So if you are, and, and by the way, that's a lot of what music publishers do as well. So, but music publishers actually contact the music supervisors for you, right? Um, but what the music supervisors would do is that they make the decisions and you can negotiate for what your fee, or what they'll tell you how much you can pay, and you can negotiate. Um, but it's just, and, and this, by the way, in addition to the fee, royalties from TV are um, they're higher than radio. So it's a really good revenue stream. Um, the other thing, if you're really not, if you're not, if this sounds very daunting for you, I would say the least that you should, I mean, you, what you really should consider doing is joining a music library, and they will. Um, they, that's their business. They help get music into films, right? So those are three options that you can pursue today, as in like looking up different music libraries, but make sure you read the terms and conditions very carefully. That is one thing that I would say, right? Um, in addition, I, I think I, think I want to kind of, um, there, is, there are a few things I want to say, and this is really where I wanted to kind of get to. Um, there are a few structural challenges that I don't want to dance around, right? In terms of live content, because um, yes, you can still have, you can still live stream your events. And as I said before, we do that. Um, what you should know is that some of the social media platforms have started pulling down those events because of music publishing rights um, infringements. Um, and I know because I spoke to someone from Dominica a few days ago that had their concert pulled down or taken down or stopped um, while they were playing their own music. So what I would say to you is this, right? If you are going to explore that avenue, you need to let your own um, collective management organization, whether it's Echo, whether it's Caught, let them know that you're going to be doing this and make sure that, you, that they inform um, persons at Instagram and, 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 and or you can send Instagram and, and Facebook and email yourself and you probably should if you don't want to be stopped. All right. Um, because um, the rights organizations are beginning to clamp down on Instagram and Facebook. Um, particularly if you're a DJ listening to this call and you're playing other people's music during your live um, performances. Some, some people have already been stopped and more will be stopped in the future. So you might want to communicate with your um, with your PR and with the social media platforms about that. Uh, it, again, if you're a DJ, you might want to also consider definitely not playing full tracks, play shorter bits of tracks, right? Um, there's one other thing there, but um, I'm going to, I'm gonna, the other, I should say it now. Um, at least cut, and I'm pretty sure that it, it will be the same for many other CMOs in the region, um, cut does not handle uh, social media. They don't touch Facebook or Instagram, right? So I definitely, when, it, when you talk about TikTok and some of those other platforms, they will not collect on those. You will need to go join Sound Exchange, right? So, and Sound Exchange was touched on by um, Carlos in the last uh, presentation. So it's, it's really important for you to kind of note these really practical things on, on, the, other, on the other side. Um, the, the, 
and the other thing about having these live stream concerts is this when you have these live stream concerts uh we don't necessarily have the best e-commerce enabling legislation or supporting environments in the caribbean so some persons find it difficult to take payments by credit cards um, we have some um, movers and shakers in the region on that note um, we have i know we pay and social ptt are trying to provide alternatives for artists to be able to get money i know um, western union also has an app i think it's cash app and our persons are also using to get money there's there's patreon there is um buy me a coffee there are lots of these things but um the the problem is that about 21 percent of the population of Trinidad and Tobago at least is unbanked entirely unbanked and an even an even an even larger percentage does not credit cards right and that goes for the entire region in terms of not having credit cards so when you're trying to use some of these platforms if you know your audience uh is really caribbean based you're going to need to really think about how to get your product to them in a way that doesn't require credit cards right and that's been a huge challenge for many caribbean artists i know there's many of them have called they've asked what do i do about um because the issue is that this is not that again i said this at the start the issue is not that we don't have content this is not that we don't have talent the issue is how do you actually monetize that right so many artists including free um accept donations via their website right um you need to pay a bit of money um to actually get that done well in the caribbean because again it's not very straightforward um and so there are some unique challenges where where e-commerce is is considered where, where e-commerce is well considered to be an option in the caribbean uh the the other thing is a lot of the sector is actually informal and many many people even listen to this call uh, probably at work and listening to listening to this doing the actual job so many of it a large part of these sectors in form another another part is, is uh secondary employment which means you have a job and you're doing this in the evenings which the secondary employment part is a global phenomenon but the informality of our sector does present some challenges so i'm just going to pray to you like this if you do not have a bank account <laughs> right um now would be a good time to form one or to get one if you are not a registered company now would be a, a good time to think about registering your company, right? Um, and understand the benefits and disadvantages of having a company that is a limited liability company versus a sole, sole trader or partnership, right? Now is a good time to get those things done. And I know in some islands, it is more difficult. Some, in some islands, they tell you you need a lawyer to do that. And so we can talk about that in the question and answer segment. I just want to get too into it. But what I would say is that's the reason for some of these regional players. They know that you're not a registered company. They know you don't have a bank account. So I mean, I was talking to Chromatics about this last week. Chromatics would, if he needs to, he would West, West, send people money via Western Union. You know, you get your statements and have the details of where it was played. Um, but because you have a bank account, he can Western Union your money. Like so, he sells uh, some some of his segment. Um, the people that he's targeting uh, are like persons who get paid by cash um, within Trinidad and Tobago. So he could just meet them and pay them cash, right? Um, because he would also serve some of our unbanked population. And for some of our regional players, they specialize in serving a population that with an underdeveloped banking sector and with persons who don't always trust banks, right? And so just that's why you have this, that's why there is some credence to the regional players versus just going with the international ones. The, the last thing I'd say is this, for some artists, um, they like being able to call their distributor on the phone when they see something online that they don't like, right? Or they don't understand. And so I would definitely say that there, you need to know what kind of artist you are and decide for yourself whether or not you want to be able to call your distributor on the phone. Because that's going to be a bit difficult if you register with the or CD, right? But if you have a regional one, if you know you're that kind of person, you might want to consider the regional alternative. Um, and so the, the, what I would call the peculiarities of the Caribbean space um, does present some challenges. And we spoke a lot about YouTube in the first one, but um, actually becoming, a, uh, actually, if you want to utilize your a YouTube page as a musician in the Caribbean, unless you have a US address, it can be 
um, difficult. Again, I know some people are going to ask about Sardis so say at one time. Um, becoming an official artist channel, when you're based in the Caribbean, what YouTube might tell you is you, you need to be part of the YouTube Partner Program and your country is not recognized, right? And so I, we recognize that as well. And there are some, some people are finding very, I'd say, creative ways around that. Um, the other thing as well is Wikipedia um, is, I think it's vital, it's an excellent point made by Carlos. It, it is really important. It may not necessarily be easy though, right? So don't feel like, you know, like if you can, like you might have the expectation that you're going to jump on and get a Wikipedia page and get it done today. It may not necessarily go as, as, as it's not like a, a click your hands and it's done, right? Um, Wikipedia has a process, all right? And uh, that is really important to so before you get started. Because as I said at the start, you have an unlimited amount of potential, but a limited amount of time and resources. So you need to kind of leverage, okay, this is going to take this amount of time. I want this to be a part of my strategy. I think it's important to have a Wikipedia page that me put aside this amount of time to do that. And, and so you just need to, I'm not telling you not to do it, obviously do it, but just go in with your eyes open. The other thing I, I would say is when you're Googling yourself um, and when you're Googling your artists, on the right hand side at the bottom of it, you see something that say claim knowledge panel. That's really, really important, right? So you need to claim your own knowledge panel. Because of COVID, the waiting time to claim your knowledge panel is, has grown and it's quite, it can be, it's actually kind of frustrating that you have to kind of wait much longer, but they have to verify that you are who you say you are, right? And claiming your knowledge panel allows you to control that right hand panel that you see when you Google someone, right? It allows you to control some of those results, like what do people actually see, the pictures and that kind of stuff, right? And that is, I would say that's also very, very important. When people are trying to answer the question, who are you as an artist? You would want to definitely think about um, claiming your knowledge panel, but know that because of COVID, it will probably take you a tad bit longer. So um, I think just knowing about the practical implications of doing business from the Caribbean, you now need to determine what your strategy is. That's really, it's, it's critical, it's imperative. Um, I just think it's, it's not something that we can, can uh, look past. It is like building a strategy that works in the region. Um, if you are a music manager, you need musician yourself, you need to make sure that you're building strategies that can work here in the, in, in the region. And also in building your strategies, please, please, please think about your resources. Because you have, again, unlimited talent, unlimited potential, but limited resources. So think about how you want to utilize your resources to achieve goals that should be clear to you because you're in a new space now. So you want to build a digital identity? Yes. You want to build a digital identity to accomplish what? Right? Uh, and it, it does make sense to have revenue goals. Um, but in terms of commercial goals as a, as a company, as a business person, but it also makes sense to have creative goals in this season of COVID. I think that's important and it also helps you to stand out in the season. Happy to take questions. And uh, as I said before, this is how you can find me uh, online. Uh, I hope it was clear, but I'm really happy to take any any questions that anyone might have based on what I've said or based on something that I probably didn't say you might want to know about. Thank you so much for your time. I do think I would say is that there, um, there is one opportunity to perform um, virtually. So some of the virtual spaces, um, when you're thinking about it, they're actually, they're actually paid, right? And I can actually advertise one. I was wasn't sure if I should, should, but I think I will, just so that some people would know um, if they were interested in being paid for an online gig, there are events like this one, right? And they, because that's what I said about having a strategy that's based around what works in the Caribbean. There are, when people think Caribbean, the two things that, that music marketers tend to think, which is like, I'm so kind of like it. Um, but Caribbean music is bigger than that, right? You need to know where you stand in the Caribbean music market and know what opportunities might be in existence. So this is a real opportunity. And if you are uh, interested in having your artists perform, um, you could simply en email entries at coralgreen.com. I'm not going to leave this slide up on the screen for, for ages, um, but I, I just want you to be able to see the email on the screen, which is entries at, at coralgreen.com. And you could, um, it, well, we're putting forward a number of acts and the festival organizers have the final say, um, but those who are selected um, will be paid to perform in this virtual festival. These opportunities exist, but you do need to find them, right? I'll say it again, those opportunities exist, but you need to be strategic in how you go about looking for them in order to find them. That's a better way to put it. I thank you guys so much for your time. I appreciate it.
Um, please let me know if you have any questions. Uh, Tiana, um, back over to you. Well, thank you. Thank you, uh, for Kieran, for your presentation and for that Caribbean uh, perspective. Um, certainly, there are many challenges and there are things maybe that um, Caribbean expert, the coalition of services in the region and, and the UKTP project can help with is bringing all the different actors uh, together. There are, for example, apps uh, that are re uh, regionally grown, like uh, Skempi, and there's another one out of uh, Suriname, which we can see how to address these payment issues and adapt it to, to that. So yes, there has to be more dialogue and collaborations to the different stakeholders. Uh, there are some questions that we have here. There are a lot of questions about uh, intellectual property rights and uh, YouTubes and uh, and some concerns about that. So either um, Carlos and you can, can answer these questions. Uh, there is uh, one question, uh, maybe we can start with you, uh, about live streaming. How do you... Uh, Try to get paid without looking like you are begging. <laughs> Is that one for me? <laughs> uh, I don't know if you're not seeing the question, so you're gonna have to like tell me. So I um, but that it, I'm guessing that question is for me. Um, how do you have like streams without looking like you're begging? Uh, there are a couple. You do have a couple of options. Um, on the one side, uh, part of it is just being tactful and being discreet, right? Um, and part of it is a language thing, um, in terms of how you put together for the persons. We we try to be as strategic as possible. We we try to use the word donate less and the word support more. And we also um, we don't make it a, a major feature of the of the content itself. We say it um, once or twice um, only. That um, you know, if you like what you're seeing, if you like what you're hearing. The opportunity exists for you to support us and how you can support us. So I feel like just being honest with people um, is really important in that regard. Um, the other thing about about um, live streaming and without looking at like your begging is this question of strategy that I was talking about earlier. So if you have your own website, like your own digital home, right? What you can do is you can have the live stream either based off your website, right? There are some services that allow you to do that, or if you have it on social media you can send people to a space where they would have the option of donating if they wanted to. Right? We're doing this on two occasions. We're doing it uh, for Freetown Thursday concert, which is the one I told you guys about uh, on Facebook on Thursdays, 6 p.m. for Trans Bigger Time. Um, and there's also another one that we're doing with an uh, artist called Private Ryan, because um, we have a song called Feed the Love right now in Trinidad Tobago. Um, and we have something called a month of love, which is when we're doing donations for other persons as well. As Carlos was saying, um, you can raise money for other courses, and we did that um, via a concert course, Soka Brainwash, the online edition. Um, and on the website, when you come to, again, this is why I, I really believe in websites, when you have your, we had the live stream, but we had the, 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 the live stream and people were able to enter, but in entering next to the end of button, you would see a donate button, and you, we'd have all the courses that people could donate to, you know, there. So I, I, I really feel it's like how you offer it. Um, actually does make a difference. And we've done it twice now, in terms of our own live streams and in terms of the month of love. So if you go to feeltheloveworldwide.com, feel, feel the worldwide.com, you see what I'm talking about. You see a donate button um, that, help, that goes towards charity. Yeah. There's another question here about what is the for, right uh, quality, standard formats to release music on uh, MP3, MP4, WMA, what? Usually, maybe what you do when you release music, what in what format? Is, is that for me or for Carlos? Oh, should I, should I do? Right. What, what what format do you use, for example? Oh, okay, cool. Yeah. So um, when we do when we release music, we actually release it in two formats. Um, one is .wav files, and the next one is .mp3 files. Um, and there's a reason for that. So different. Um, different agencies need it. So this is the other thing, right? So when you release really music, um, what a distributor would do is that the distributor would probably ask you for the same thing. You ask for your .wav files, .wav files, and then your, your, your MP3 files. And 
when he when he, when you hand over those files, first thing to do, of course, is um, particularly if you're using one of the international options and you cannot call people over the phone, please, please, please. Even if you're using a regional or local one, like Chromatics or Shager Media or Foxviews, please double check your file to make sure you're sending the right version. Regardless of the format, make sure you send the right version because that has been a real problem in the past. People sending the wrong version of the song and then trying to take it off of iTunes and put up a new version. So regardless of format, please get that right. But what it would ask you for is a, a, a .wav version and a .mp3 version of, of all the songs that are going up. And then they're going to produce a smart URL where um, somebody can find your music on all of the platforms, Deezer, um, Spotify. Um, so I'd say both. Um, you, you do that wave and um, MP3. All right. Uh, Carlos, uh, there are some questions for you. One is very general. How do you get make money out of um, out of um, out of your art or if your music? And the other is how you make sure you earn money when you submit your material on other people's platform. Carlos? You muted, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not sure, yeah, try to meet, unmute yourself. Yes. You get to go. <laughs> All right. I think yeah, you have to turn on your webcam um, here. Yeah. You can see you, I can see you. I, it's on, webcam is on, right? Yeah, I can see you. Okay. All right. Give a, give a, give a thing. Thank you. <laughs> All right, so, how to make money, you know, in, in the digital in the digital world, it might seem complex, but any distribution company that you use will get your royalties on any of the of the sites that that they're distributing to. So it could be 10, 50, 100, 200 different companies where you're generating royalties from. If it's from downloads and streams and you have a distribution company, they'll get you the royalty. So the key is choose a company that fits you, whether it's uh, something regional, local, international. 95% of the system works in terms of those royalties. There are some things that get lost in the shuffle every once in a while, but in general, you know, the system works. In terms of distribution, um, if you're using a reputable company, you'll have your royalties. So that's for the recordings in terms of publishing that's i'll say difficulty level two not difficult but one step above uh, two things you need to keep in mind uh, performing rights organizations again register and give them the correct information for them to work uh, either your local organization international make sure that you're represented throughout the world one strategy that people in the caribbean use is I'll join my local PRO and then use one of the US PROs to represent me for the rest of the world. So my country with my local and the rest of the world with a US based uh, PRO. That will get you the money for your mainly radio and TV airplay as long as you send them the correct information. Okay, so that's it's a two way street. Okay, so that's in terms of public performance and in terms of publishing administration. Uh, there might be cover songs of your own compositions, okay? And if you don't do the work, no one's going to come to your door and hand you the money. Say, here's $5 of royalties. You need to set up your uh, your royalty collection platform. So very similar to the distribution that you do with CD Baby, TuneCore, and any other company. Most of these distribution companies will also have publishing administration for an additional fee. And they will look for the different platforms and look for your compositions being streamed, and they'll get you royalties for that. So it's in your hands. Uh, Maybe uh, may have an, a small fee compared to the type of service you're getting, but in terms of sound recordings with your distribution companies, you'll get paid royalties. In terms of compositions, definitely join a performing rights organization either for global representation or one for your country and another one for the rest of the world and get publishing administration from from a distribution company and that will get your hands on again 95 percent of the royalties always five percent gets lost in the shuffle an additional service which i mentioned uh is audium a u d i a m 
they also collect uh, publishing and composition royalties from YouTube as well as master use royalty. So sound recordings and compositions can be collected through Audium. So A-U-D-I-A-M. Uh, that should cover, again, 95%. The other 5% is uh, sometimes things fall through the cracks, you know, but you should be covered with, with distribution, publishing administration, performing rights organization, and also Audium. Right. Uh, here, uh, is if there is a difference between the CMOs from the regions, the collection agencies from the region or international? Yeah, so, so there's a huge, there's some huge differences here. So in terms of, so CUT and several of the other ones in the region, CUT definitely also does some publishing. So there's a box that you have to tick on CUT's membership form uh, if you want them to handle your publishing, which is meant, which, which means they'll negotiate when someone wants to use the song, um, they'll take a fee, they'll handle some of those um, that, that publishing work for you if you want them to. Um, some artists do not um, tick that box at all. Um, uh, if they want to handle their own publishing. The other thing um, that you should note about the CMOs in the region is that it's not, how do I put this? I want to make sure I, I say this diplomatically. Um, what Carlos is talking about is what we call split membership, which many artists are, are beginning to pursue more and more often. Uh, I don't know how much regional CMOs actually like it though. So you have to you have to actually ask ask a question. No one is going to tell you. Listen, you should actually split your membership. No one is going to do that for you. Yeah, so you have to ask. Um, or you have to say, I'd like to split my membership. What do I need to do in order to split my membership? What might happen is that you might get about ten different arguments of why you should not split your membership, and then you're going to have to make sure you understand why you want to split your membership, right? Because some of the points you see I'm making. To be fair to them about it, and some of them are they're saying it doesn't make any sense unless you are actually putting in a, a substantial amount of revenue from overseas. It doesn't make any sense to um, register with BMI or ASCAP uh, or, or PRS in in the UK and then have a cost cap or, or echo represent you in the Caribbean. Right? Um, many of them would argue that, but the reason why artists tend to want to spend their money is that they think that they are earning a substantial amount overseas. And they don't want to have to pay. What would happen if, let's say, for example, just practically speaking, you have a song that's doing really well in New York, right? Um, so, uh, example, Free Tongue Collective, our song is now number one on the charts in Trinidad and Tobago. It's not doing badly in New York either. So, for us, what I said was, and this is practical experience of sharing here, uh, again, what I said was, actually, we have a song that's doing pretty well in the US right now. If we don't split our membership, what would happen is BMI or ASCAP will collect that money on our behalf then charge an admin fee, or a hand fee as they call it, to send that money down to, um, to CUT in the Caribbean. And then CUT will pay me, but CUT will pay me after an admin fee as well. So I, I'll end up paying two admin fees. So what many artists in the Caribbean want to do is, they want to split, so they only pay, so they say BMI, ASCAP, PRS, whoever, you collect for me in these territories of the world, and uh, CUT and, and COSCAP and, and those are entities uh, you can collect for me in the ACCS. Um, you will receive different responses based on which CMO you're going to, um, but make sure you listen to the arguments that they're making because some of those arguments are very valid. So not everybody needs to split, and so just make sure you have a conversation and don't please don't fight about this. Uh, I'm, I'm getting more and more instances of artists fighting about this point. They, please don't fight about this. Just have a conversation, a, a dialogue with your CMO about. It. Yeah. All right. Um, we all, we almost have to finish here, but there's a question about where would you go and see how your if you release something online, how you see what the web traffic is. Uh, if there is a preferred site where you go and see that, or you have to see on each of the platforms. Uh, either of you, uh, Carlos and Karen. Um, Carlos, I'm, I'm sure you have. Yeah, so there are a couple, of, there are a couple of things that you can use. Um, well, the license has expired for Trinidad and Tobago, but there is a there uh, up until about two months ago, the Music TT, which is based in Trinidad, was subscribing to an organization called BMAT. Um, BMAT actually um, they monitor radio play across the world. They monitor like music period, 
Um, and they're able to do that because every song has something called an ISRC code. Right? And so there are a few websites though that you can go. Uh, if you Google this, like monitor music, um, you, you are going to find BMAT's website. That's B-M-A-T. And you should be able to at least get some basic data on how your song is performing. That's, that's number one. The number two is some of the platforms now have very good interfaces for managers and persons who are interested in monitoring how your music is doing. So for example, Apple Music um, has introduced something called Apple Music for Artists and Apple Music for Apple Managers, for Artist Managers, which is when you can go into the back end and you can actually see how much is on the screen in New York, in Germany. And so I, I, I monitor that every single week. I go on and I, I look at how our sounds are performing in different parts of the world. And so, and that, that information is vital to me because if I want to boost a post on Facebook, I know that I want to boost it to this market because our, our music is beginning to pick up there. So I monitor those things very regularly. You can also get the same services from Spotify. Um, and depending on who your distributor is, what your distributor will do for you, at, at a minimum, what your distributor should be able to do for you is tell you how your, your, your sounds are performing on different platforms. So every quarter we get a statement that shows how many times we got played on YouTube and different forms of YouTube. Um, because you can you get different money for art topics and different things. But you get you got you got you show you you show you how many times how many times you got played on YouTube, how many times on Apple, how many times on Deezer, how many times on Tidal, and all the different platforms. When you look at that, then you can go to the different platforms and check out how which demographics are actually listening to your music on those platforms. So that's actually how you can do it. Um, but for those of you based in Trinidad Tobago, you might actually wanna send a short message to me to TT and just ask them when they're gonna be able to renew that, that live license. Hopefully put some pressure on our government to actually be able to monitor music again, because that was a very, very useful tool. Until then, look at the distribution statements, see what platforms you're doing really well on, and then access those platforms to actually monitor how your music is doing in the past world. That's one. Um, Carlos, you might have another special problem. Um, <laughs> we have to move to another to another question, Carlos. Uh, what are the realistic expectations for pivoting live events such as the jazz festivals, which the region has several of them? Extremely feasible. Sadly, twenty percent of revenue of of what was expected, twenty thirty percent. Uh, opportunities will be to integrate with live streaming online beyond the youtube live streaming uh a potential pay uh like a classic pay-per-view type of situation where you can pay for the content to be delivered with a higher quality with additional uh information so yeah the uh the ticket sales uh traditional ticket sales are are going to suffer and from the examples that we've seen for example the show in in the us that i mentioned it was a 1000 person venue the show happened with 200 people and that's what they were expecting it was a quote unquote sold out but for you know 20 percent of the capacity again you know people still want music regardless of of the current situation it's everyone's responsibility to figure out okay how are we going to make up for that 80% of tickets that we didn't sell, can we sell additional merchandise? Can we provide digital transmission for people who can travel, for people who don't want to be with a thousand people around them? And and the two answers are yes and yes. Uh, it's the opportunities are there, the fans are there. That's not disappearing. So as of different circumstances, uh, we've seen how uh, the uh, Paid, per paid performances online uh, can do, and they can do well, whether it's with advertisement that you're selling specifically for that event or a paywall to allow people to access the content, plus what else can you think of? You know, access to the show for the next two, two months. You can access the show's archives for the next two months. So plenty of ideas on the table. It's just a matter of, of putting together something that, that people find value. And the most basic, answer of this is a basic YouTube live streaming or a basic Instagram stream. That's That should be free. You know, there's not, not too much value added on it, but what can you do to add value 
to that to that show that you've created and that you've built for how many years so yeah uh, opportunities are there uh, traditional ticket sales are going to be lower but you can live stream you can stream with additional access you can stream with extended access to whatever was recorded you can create additional merchandise you can pre-sell tickets for for future events so yeah, the opportunities are there and the fans remember that that slide the finger pointing at you the fans definitely want you as an artist it's just a matter of figuring out ways to connect well, we are in an experimental uh, phase. Everybody's trying to find the right uh, formula. Thank you so much, Carlos and, and Karen. Uh, we we gonna end it here. If you, uh, I think we answer most of, uh, of, of the questions. Um, but we at Caribbean Expert, at uh, the UK TP project, we of course, and the coalition of services in each of your countries, we are at your disposal to answer all the questions. Uh, the UKT Pre project is a project financed by the United Kingdom uh, to support artists to promote uh, music, uh, among other sectors of the creative industries, music into the EU and the, and the EU and the UK market. And we will be uh, collaborating with Caribbean Export uh, through, and the Coalition of Services to help the sector and it enter those those markets we will select we will be selecting some some companies to accompany them in the next two years but we will also be contributing on the information in the um connections of of the markets and in future events caribbean export i'm going to is going to put forward so thank you so much carlos kieran for your participations all of you for your questions and for your engagement and uh, the recording of this will be in uh, Caribbean Expert website, so you can go back. Some of you missed some of the answers, so you can go back and look at the, the answers to your questions or and, and the presentations. Thank you so much, and um, uh, please stay safe and stay engaged with your mark. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. The Caribbean Export. Thank you very much, and to our collaborators. Thank you. I think it was an excellent um, session today. I look forward to continuing to work with the region. Thank you. Okay. You're on the digital pivot. The digital pivot. Oh, excellent. <laughs> Ready. Are we looking at internal still communication now? No, oh, I am trying to turn it off. I don't know. Oh, okay. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Thank, you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. It was indeed a pleasure. Thanks to the presenters. Once again, thanks to our collaborators again. And Caribbean Export looks forward to continue to work with the sector. Okay. Excellent. Will you turn it off? Yes. Okay. Is it off now? Oh, not showing anything. Are you off now? No. Nope. Alison, can you turn it off?